Let me just take you through the design of the training course so that you understand how we're going to try and communicate this information. As you know, the forest farm facility supports forest and farm producer organizations and, and we support them towards climate resilient landscapes so, and improved livelihoods. So we want uh, to help those organizations build businesses that improve livelihoods while also being resilient to climate change. And in, with that overall goal, um, we're hoping that by the end of this training course, you'll, you'll have a bit more confidence, firstly, to install business support services, business incubation services into your organization. We hope you'll be able to help businesses undertake a risk self-assessment process. And that's critical to, to set a trajectory for the business that tries to tackle the main risks it faces. And we hope you'll be able to uh, use one or two of 30 options for making your businesses a bit more resilient in the face of climate change. Throughout the training course, I'll be providing some examples, as many as 40 examples from around the world of these sort of approaches. And I hope to illustrate some elements of women uh, specific issues that need to be tackled in, that, in those examples. And at the end, we're hoping that you'll be able to use the toolkits that we're sending you to train other people um, so that you can pass on this knowledge. Now we've got five days, it's very short, we've got two and a half hours each day, um, virtual sessions. What that'll mean is that I'll try and give three half hour blocks of teaching with a 10 minute question and answer session and then we'll set you some homework which we will review at, for half an hour at the beginning of the next day's training. So I hope that's all work for you. In terms of the structure, um, the first day today, we're going to try and cover business incubation. So we're going to introduce it. We'll try and say what the scope of it might be for you, and then trying to help you understand and plan how you would offer business incubation services, um, follow up on them uh, with your own forest and farm producer organizations. And for the homework today, we're going to have um, a little bit of thinking about what challenges does a business you know face and what services could you offer to help it with those challenges. Tomorrow, we'll turn our attention to risk management and, and we'll introduce a securing forest business toolkit. We'll teach you how to identify risks, um, how to go through a process of identifying and then ranking the risks so that you can begin to say, well, these are important risks or, or less important risks. And for the homework, we'll have an exercise that uh, allows you to, to practice that. On day three, we'll carry on with risk assessment. So then we'll be thinking about, well, once we've prioritized our risks, how do we, um, yeah, how do we manage? How do we put risk management in place? And how do we develop an implementation plan um, so that in a year's time, you've actually addressed some of the risks you've identified? And how do you report and monitor those sorts of risk assessment processes? So we'll have some homework linked to that. On day four, um, we're going to turn our attention to a specific subset of risks that are to do with climate change. And rather than focus on the risk, which we'll have covered in the previous two days, we'll try and take you through um, some options for climate resilience. And, and those options are, are drawn in different sorts of options for becoming climate resilience. There are things you can do within your organization, social options, 
There are things that you can do with your farms and forests, ecological options and economic options for resilience. And we'll have a sort of bit of homework to, to, th to get you to think, what are we already doing and what could we add based on the training from today? Um, let me just admit somebody. Then finally, on day five, we'll look at the last set, at last category of uh, climate resilience options to do with putting in place different physical and technological infrastructure. And as we finish this toolkit, we're going to also just pay a little bit of attention to, well, how would we get financing? How would we improve access to finance for the institutions we work with? And how could we spread the knowledge of our business incubation, risk management and climate resilience to attract climate finance to support our work? Um, and that will leave you with a whole year of homework to try and put some of this toolkit into practice. So I hope that gives you a flavor. So we've got a day on business incubation, two days on risk assessment and two days on climate resilience. And, and let me just um, stop there briefly. If you've got any particular questions or, or queries, um, if you could write them in the chat and uh, or raise your hand and I'll get Kata to try and spot anybody who's raised their hand. So have you got any questions about the structure of what we're going to do over the next few days? Please do, as I say, if you could each think, what is what am I really hoping to get out of this training course? and write your expectation for the training course into the chat. That would really help us so that as we go through the training course, we can make sure we're meeting your expectations. Does anybody have a question in the chat, please? Um. It looks like that's fairly clear then, um, but do, do write any questions you might have, uh, uh, queries, worries, and particularly expectations into the chat and we'll try and respond to them um, as we go. So, in which case, let me, um, as we're waiting for those, uh, let me, uh, we've got one question. Will there be some planning of each participant to put in place their, in their FFPO what they've learned? So yes, thank you, Johnny, for that question. Um, yes, each day, Johnny, what we're going to finish with is a set of homework exercises. Um, and what we will do is we will try and get people to apply their knowledge to their specific FFPO and then bring their thoughts uh, uh, back and present it to their colleagues at the beginning of the next day. So thank you for that useful question. There's another question from Mark there, Duncan, on um, yes. whether we could have any specific cases around how businesses have mitigated risks associated with COVID. That's a very good uh, point, Mark. And yes, um, I think we should in the risk uh, management session, uh, give some examples of how you have been coping with risks associated with COVID. So one of the, um, one of the uh, pieces of homework is to think through what are the most critical risks facing your business. And I'm sure some of them will be to do with COVID, so we can handle that. And, oh, we've got Hajia has now joined us from Ghana, a uh, member of the Savannah Women's Farmers Association. That's great. And the Women's Wing of GAPAP, excellent. Um, are there anybody else who has joined us um, in the interim? Would you just like to take an opportunity, maybe, 
Hajia, could you just say hello and introduce yourselves to everyone? You might be on mute. Well, you've, you've introduced yourself on the chat. So uh, is there anybody else who hasn't said hello yet who would just like to um, say they've joined? Oh, I've got another question. Could we have some clear methodologies and tools for risk assessment and resilience analysis? Thank you for that question, Anani. Yes. We will provide you with some clear methodologies for risk assessment, and we'll also be sharing with you a published toolkit on risk assessment, which we hope you'll be able to take and use um, that explains risk assessment and resilience analysis. So thank you for that question. And I've got another introduction from Damien James from Wibwara Rusha. <laughs> <laughs> Farmers Organization in Arusha, Tanzania. Great. And Vincent, thank you for joining us. Vincent Zeba from FFF Zambia as the national facilitator there. Very good. Well, listen, let's me, let me um, press on then because we've got a lot of material to get through today on uh, business incubation. And I'll try and get through this first section and then we'll have any more questions. Um, so I'm just, so I've introduced the structure of the day already. We're going to introduce Forest Business Incubation is. We're going to look at the scope of it, the types of people you might want to help. And then in the afternoon, in the last session, we'll, we'll have um, a little bit of uh, a teaching on what services you might want to offer and how to deliver them with some homework at the end. So let me start by introducing a toolkit. Now, Ali has, um, in your invitation, sent you a link to a toolkit called Forbink which is a business incubation toolkit. And that's what we'll be using, modeling this one day training on. But first, let's uh, start by saying, what is a business incubation? And perhaps the best way of thinking about business incubation is, is to think of a hen incubating its eggs. Now the eggs have already been laid, so the businesses have already been started, but the hen still needs to nurture and sit on and keep the eggs warm until they hatch and can stand on their own two feet. And that's very much what an incubation process is. So it's not about starting up a business, we have a toolkit called Market Analysis and Development, which is for starting up a business. For business incubation, we're trying to think more about once these businesses are started, how can we support them um, so that they don't fail, so that they survive? And the, the business incubation toolkit, which you'll see on the right-hand side, was based on some work we did at the Forest and Farm Facility um, called Forest Business Incubation. It's a book. And that book looked at 10 examples of forest business incubators around the world and tried to distill some of the knowledge into a practical set of guidance to help you with. So you can get access to both of those products on the IIED website. And I'll ask Ali just to circulate the link to the Forbink toolkit in the chat so that anybody who wants to get access and hasn't had a chance to look at it gets a chance to do that. And that can be part of your homework today. Within this forest business incubation toolkit, we try to think of a circle 
of things you need to put in place to make forest business incubation work. So the idea here is that a forest and farm producer organization itself should try and be uh, incubating businesses of its members. And for that, we have to think, well, which clients do we want to help? And that might be subgroups within a producer organization who want to uh, nurture a particular type of business. So we, we need to have a little bit of thinking about how do we identify uh, groups that you can see those little dots uh, are maybe subgroups within an organization who we're trying to help incubate their businesses. The second step we need to do is we need to design what sort of uh, support services we want to offer to our clients. So to the members within our FFPO, ha what sort of structure we need to set up, what sort of staff we need to have in place to be able to act as a business incubator. Once we have, we know what our clients need and we've designed what sort of structure we want to put in place, we have to think about actually how do we deliver those support services to our members. So there's a, a section on services, what sort of training, what sort of networking are we going to offer? What sort of links to finance are we going to provide? And then there's the question of management. How do we um, manage that whole process? We don't want it to become a, a support process that goes on forever. So we want to be able to say, well, we are going to select you as a, as a group that we want to support. We're going to provide you with some services and then we're going to exit so that we say, now you are fully incubated, if you like and you have to stand on your own two feet. So there's a, a little bit on management. How do you manage an incubator? And finally, we want to talk a little bit about um, how do we monitor this process so we, we understand the impact it's having on our clients and on the structures we've set up so that we improve the business incubation um, services over time. So that's essentially, if you look at the four bink toolkit, you'll see those five steps within it, those five modules within it. And what we want to do today is to introduce you to some of that so that you feel, okay, we could try to set up a business incubator in our forest and farm producer organization um, that does this sort of work. Let me give you an example. Um, so uh, this example is from Nepal. And uh, essentially in Nepal, there were groups of forest producers who were thinking what sort of business to do with their, to, to, to develop from their community forest areas. And they decided to set up a business in charcoal production. Um, and uh, they, they decided that they wanted to make um, charcoal briquettes uh, to sell into the city of Kathmandu in Nepal. Now in this particular example, ANSAB, which is a, a, an NGO, decided to incubate their business. And it, it looked first at, well, what are the challenges facing that business? What are the needs of those community groups. And one of the needs was that um, they didn't have a very good uh, market. People didn't understand about charcoal briquettes. And so they started to develop labeling, which explained to the buyer what these briquettes were and how you use them. And they also worked with a stove producer you can see on the bottom left that this is a ceramic stove and you put a briquette in and it's actually for heating your house in Nepal. Um, so that is how you provide heating. Nepal is a mountainous country with very cold temperatures. And so the incubator 
decided to provide these services to the communities. It helped them develop packaging and labeling. It helped them develop a stove that would fit their briquettes that they could sell along with the briquettes. And then it helped them to market the product. So you can see in the bottom that the incubator helped the community groups to establish sales outlets for their products in Kathmandu. So that's the sort of thing an incubator does. It doesn't run the business, but it, it stands ready to help the business to progress over time. Why, why is business incubation so important? Um, I think thinking in the big picture, we have to remember that smallholder farmers and communities dominate what happens in forest landscapes. And also that farming is the biggest cause of forest loss. Um, so we have a, a, a both a, a scale issue here. We have lots of rural communities trying to use forest and farm landscapes. And those producers are the key to producing food, to restoring forests, to developing rural economies and to climate action. And so we want to help them to run businesses that sustainably manage the natural resources where they're based. But most of these rural communities are very isolated. And the cost for somebody in the capital city of providing business advice to rural communities is very high. So there's a gap, a support gap that we have. Um, and forest business incubation can fill that support gap if the forest business incubator is actually the forest and farm producer organization itself. When we're thinking why is forest business incubation so important? Well, actually we know from all around the world that the failure rates of small businesses are very high. But research has shown us that businesses that receive business support services, forest business incubation, that doubles the rate of survival. So business incubation, if you have somebody to give you a helping hand with your business, to give you advice and support, that can double the chance that you'll end up with a sustainable business at the end of it. We also know that the best people to do, to give that advice, to provide business support, are the forest and farm producer organizations themselves. Once you have a successful business being run by a forest and farm producer organization, you, you are in a very good position to offer advice to other groups in your region who want to run a sustainable business because you've already learned the lessons of what works, what doesn't work. And so we think that the forest and farm producer organizations are excellent business incubators. Um, now, let me give you an example of one very successful forest business incubator from Guatemala. So in Guatemala, there are many community forest groups and they produce a variety of things. They produce coffee, they produce cardamom, they sell timber and do processed timber. They run ecotourism businesses. And what they did is they grouped together those forest and farm producer organizations in an association called Fedecovera. So that's a producer organization that represents many smaller community forest groups. And Fedecovera learned how to do particular types of business. So they started helping the coffee producers to process and sell coffee. They help the cardamom producers to, to process and sell cardamom. And as they gained business experience, they began to um, be able to offer training in how to run a business. So recently, and Johnny will know this example, they set up a business training school 
for other producer organizations how to run a successful business. But they were also a business in their own right. So Feder Cavera was actually selling some of the products from these regions. It was an umbrella organization that was selling many different types of product. And because of that, they were generating profits and they started also to provide financial support, credit, that, that farmer groups could loan money from Feder Covera and then pay it back in order to get their businesses started. So forest and farm producer organizations are, can become really important sources of business support and forest business incubation. How does, how does it work? Well, as I've said, we're not really talking about startup businesses here. We're, we're talking about supporting businesses that are already established. So usually in year zero, if you like, on this chart, you've, you're trying to start a business. Now, business incubation is really trying to help businesses in subsequent years who've already established, trying to help them to do better than they would otherwise do. So helping them to develop a business plan, thinking about market advice and market research, thinking about how to attract finance into that business, maybe helping them to export their products to new markets. And, and by providing that sort of business incubation support, um, you're making the business do better than it would otherwise do. And as I've said, we, we've got good evidence that business incubation doubles the success rate of, of businesses in different contexts. Another thing to think about when we're thinking about business incubation is that if you don't have business incubator support, every single business, if you think of, if you're a business like those blue dots that you can see on the left-hand side, every single business has to um, work out how to register their business with government authorities. Every business has to work out how, how to link to the market. And every business has to find out about finance and input, where to buy its input, its packaging or its processing separately. And that's a lot of work for every single business. But if you have an incubator, the experience of the incubator can make those links much easier for all the businesses. So it saves a lot of time and effort um, for the businesses. Um, now, there are many uh, toolkits out there uh, on business incubation. The World Bank, I think, put together a 12 module toolkit, uh, which you can see on the right hand side about how to design and run a, an, an incubator. Often incubators, business incubators sell their services to um, businesses. So they say, if you want business support, you can pay us and we'll provide that support. The problem for forest and farm areas in places like Africa is there are f very few businesses being started. And so the business incubator would never have enough business to make that incubation profitable for them. And so we have a gap we have the fact that business support providers often don't work in rural forest and farm areas. However, farmers always group together in some way, work together in some way to pool their information and to sell their products, to get finance and to share their costs. So the experience of these farmer groups can begin to help other farmer groups in the region to run businesses better. And so that's why we think forest and farm groups can become business incubators. We need a special approach. Um, it's, not, it's not like being in a city 
where there are everything you need is is just um, at hand. In when you're trying to run a forest and farm business, you have uh, problems of being quite remote. There are high transport costs and communication costs. You almost always have to work together to sell larger volumes of product so that you can take that product to the market, which is quite expensive. And so you need to have an organized group to run a business successfully in a remote forest area. So one of the things a business incubator has to do in, in forest and farm landscapes is to concentrate on helping an organization develop. Um, and these organizations usually make their decisions collectively, which slows up the process. You can often get conflicts um, between different producers that you have to have sort of a little bit more experience in conflict management. And when we're talking about growing trees and, and using trees as a business, that often takes a lot of time. Um, so you have to think of how are we going to finance that so that farmers are motivated to put in, in the trees. Um, in rural areas, we have low levels of education often, and, and there are differences often between women and men in access to education and support. So we might need to have a specific approach for helping women's businesses, um, particularly ones that are rooted in the local production system and culture, um, the roles, the different roles men and women play in the rural environment making sure that we um, design business support for women as well as men. In rural areas, there's all, always a lot of informality too. It's often difficult to get the, all the permits you need to do business. So a business incubator needs to support businesses through that process of registration, getting the right documents. And let me give you, you know, I was lucky enough to visit this particular community in Ghana, and um, they were pre they were working with Tropenboss was was helping them incubate their business. Um, and what the farmers were doing was trying to plant um, black pepper in a, a government forest area, uh, and they were then selling the black pepper um, to the market. But the uh, the whole process for the community of, well, how do we get formal rights to grow our pepper in these forest areas? How do we process the pepper and package it and market it so that it is profitable for us? How do we get enough pepper that a buyer would be interested in buying our pepper from our region? Um, that needed support and Tropenboss were trying to help the, the uh, the producer organizations um, make a success of their black pepper. So the, in this introductory session that I'm giving you, I think the most important point I want to try and convince you of is that if a forest and farm producer organization is running a business, it should be able to help other groups who are trying to run businesses. So forest and farm producer organizations like Vivata, like um, uh, you know, NACO in the Gambia, should be in a good position to provide incubation services to their members. So you should think about yourself, your organization as a business incubator in the future. And I hope this diagram will help you to understand what it is that a forest business incubator does. So you might have many individual producers, the green dots on the left-hand side of the diagram, and they one group might be producing black pepper, another group might be producing timber, somebody might be selling cabbages or um, cassava, so there are many different producer groups 
and you have some kind of forest and farm producer organization that is trying to help their members. And that group is, it could become an incubator. Well, what does it do as an incubator? Essentially, it tries to link those producer groups to the sorts of support that can help them. So you might need help in registering your business, getting legal papers, transport permits. So the incubator can learn how to do that and link you to the right government agency. Or you might need to um, process your product in a new way. And you don't know how to do that. You don't know how to grind up your pepper in a way that you could sell uh, to the market. So the incubator can do a little bit of research. What sort of machinery is best uh, used for pepper grinding? And so you don't, the incubator doesn't have to be a, a professional who understands everything about pepper grinding, but you need to know who to link to who can provide that advice. Similarly, you might need help with, well, how do we develop a business plan um, to get some finance for our business? And, and again, you might have in your country um, business support services that you can link to that'll provide you with the sort of support you need. So in each of these cases, technical advice, how to organize a, a social organization that is robust and has the right sort of procedures in place to run a business. You learn over time how it works and then you help the groups to link to the right people. Does that make sense? So that diagram I hope will give you a feel. So you don't have to know everything yourself to be a business incubator, but you have to build up a network of contacts that can provide you with the right sort of um, support and advice so that your producer groups within your umbrella organization can get access to the right sort of support they need. And the more you do of that support and linking, the better you will become, the more useful you'll become um, in providing those services to your members. So we've got, uh, we've got these five steps um, that I want to take you through. We, we, we need to choose who we're going to help. We need to think about how do we set up as, and staff a unit that is responsible for business incubation in our organization. We need to think what services should we be providing and what services do we need to link to other people who could provide those? How do we manage all of this? And how do we measure success? Those are the five steps that I took you through. How do we, we start by looking at the people we're trying to help. What are their needs? What do they lack information about? Secondly, we think, okay, who's responsible within our organization for helping I said, you got one token. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, what sort of services should we provide? Fourthly, what sort of management process are we going to put in place? And finally, how do we measure success? And I just want to finish this section um, by giving you the example of China. Now, in China, um, the government recognized that in rural areas, it was very difficult for rural communities to run sustainable businesses. And so what they did was that they... Oh, Salamatu, okay, we've, yeah. <laughs> so um, what they did was they set up, in the bottom you can see a picture of something called a Chinese timber market and trade center. And the government actually set up these centers as a one-stop shop for providing business advice to forest and farm businesses in China. They provided technical advice on, on planting trees, on planting crops. They provided business advice, how to write a business plan. They provided insurance and finance, 
and they provided help with market sort of running trade fairs and so on. And you can see in China over the last, well, 30 years now, that the area of forest is actually increasing because more and more farmers are realizing that they can make good money out of selling trees. And the reason those farmers are doing that is because they have these support services that can help, that can take them through the process of setting up and running a business. And you'll see in the map, the area of forest increase in China that has resulted. So forest business incubation is not just about making, uh, improving livelihoods. It's also about creating more sustainable, more varied forest and farm landscapes that are profitable for the people within them. So I'm going to stop there because that was a lot of introduction and I'm going to just um, take a few minutes now to see whether we've got any questions. Do you understand what a forest business incubator is and why we think it's so important? So I'd welcome any questions that you might have, probably easiest if you write them in the chat. Uh, while we're waiting for people to reflect on your question, Duncan, I just um, noticed that there were three people from Tanzania who joined in the meantime. Great. And two um, participants from FAO Togo. And then we had a question, a general question from Anani, whether um, participants would be receiving a certificate at the end of the training. And a yes. general comment from Mark. Um, um, on um, the context of the social organization being of importance um, as an entry point for smallholder FFPOs um, in terms of using strength in numbers, um, particular, in particular towards um, accessing or internally mobilizing finance. <clears throat> um, Very good questions, all of them. So, um, so yes. Um, we should, we could and should um, provide you with a certificate of training. So I'm going to ask <laughs> Ali, who's the coordinator of the forest team here at IAD, um, to, to, to maybe help me develop a certificate so that all of you who've stayed throughout the course um, can get a certificate in the training. Um, I hope that's that's an answer to that question. Um, secondly, in terms of Mark's question, um, one of the roles a business incubator can play is helping a group organize itself for business. And that's really important because um, when you're trying to sell something, you usually get a much better price if you sell in bulk as a group. You can negotiate the price together and you can stop traders from playing individual farmers off against each other and negotiating down the price. So the bigger, the more members you have who've agreed to sell as a group, the, light, the, the higher the chance that you'll get a good price for your product. And so one of the things we have to do when we're incubating businesses in rural areas is to try and strengthen and increase the size of groups who are selling products, the selling the same thing together and get them to agree to sell the product as a single group and not as individual farmers where they're very unlikely to get a good price. Um, so that's one of the, one of the things. Uh, uh, once, once you've got a group that's selling a large amount of product together, you can perhaps work on making sure that all of the farmers are producing high quality um, and you can develop a, a logo and packaging for your product so that it's those machines that you need for packaging and, and labeling, they're shared costs among a large number of farmers and so they're more affordable. Um, so social organization is a critical important point and thanks Mark for raising that issue. And I would like to welcome um, Dao uh, Prenibe 
and uh, Lamboni, Sadja Lamboni from uh, Togo. So welcome to, to the group. Have we got any other questions about what a business incubator is? What, what we're, why we're talking about this? Yes, so I've got a question from Johnny, um, uh, which is, uh, if you, in, in countries, um, you often have business incubators, sort of professional business support. Um, in, do we need to have our far, forest and farm producer organizations also incubating um, business? Um, and, I, and I think the answer to that question is yes, we do need forest and farm producer organizations to be able to incubate their own businesses because often the professional business support services are based a long way away from the rural areas. And secondly, they're often quite expensive in providing uh, advice to businesses. So the more advice and professional business development services we can offer ourselves, the better it is for our members. Um, I'm going to talk about financing the business incubator in a bit, so I'll answer that question then. Uh, and yes, thank you. Uh, we have a summary of what a business incubator is. It provides startups and early stage businesses with the support and resources those young groups need to make progress, to, to do things better. So thank you very much for that, that summary. That's absolutely right. Good. Well, in that case, let me, um, you can, you can uh, when we have these question sessions, if you need to grab a drink of water or take a comfort break, please do. And then I'll try and move on to, um, to, to the next section of the training. So in the first module, I introduced you to the idea of what a business in incubator is. And in this next module, I'm going to try and um, put a little bit more detail on what should be the scope of the services we're trying to provide. <clears throat> How do we choose what, what groups to help? How do we look at what their needs are and so on? <clears throat> How do we staff our business incubator? And I'm going to focus first on these particular things of, we need to first think about who we're trying to help, which clients are we trying to help, and how can we assess what they're struggling with, what they need in terms of support. Then I'm going to look at, well, okay, now that we know what our clients need, how can we structure ourselves internally to, to try and uh, staff and finance an incubator? And I hope that's clear. So these are very simple steps. Um, you, the idea is that you gradually use your experience of business to help other groups who are trying to do business. And, and you might, it, it depends very much on sp what sort of organization your forest and farm producer organization is, or whether you're a support organization like FAO or NACO or, or something, you know, a little bit who's got its own resources to provide support. And the first thing we need to think about is who are we going to try and help? Um, and I think, this is, this is very important because obviously it takes time and effort to support somebody develop a business. So we need to keep it manageable. Um, often the best way of starting um, these, these things is if a forest and farm producer organization says, right, we've got a business running honey production in Tanzania um, and we know how to begin to manage a business, we know how to write a business plan. How can we help another group of farmers within our area develop a business they're interested in? And that might be avocado growing, 
or it might be um, nursery seedling production. And so you have to decide who it is you're going to try and help and keep it at the beginning of a forest business incubator, keep that list of people quite manageable. The second thing we need to do is we need to assess what it is they're struggling with. So we need to understand the nature of their business and, and what support they need. And there's no shortcut for going, once you know who you're going to try and help, having a visit to those people and, and looking at how do they get their product from the field to the place where they sell it? What are all the stages in that value chain? Uh, you have to plant the, the crop. Do they have problems with um, getting access to good seed or in knowing how to plant? Um, when they harvest the crop, um, they need to process it. Do they have the technology they need to do that? Do they have the advice about where to buy that technology? When they're thinking about transport, what are the problems with the transport to the cities? Do they, do they have a problem with transport? What sort of support would they need for that? And finally, sales in the city. Are they depending on only one buyer who's not giving them a better and a very good price? Could we do some market research to find other buyers who might uh, compete with that first buyer and give them a better price? So we need to assess the needs of our group who we're trying to help. And then we need to sort of think about, well, what are the problems they're facing? Do we already have, we, we need a map of what sort of support they need. Are there already people out there who are providing um, the sort of support they need. So do, if we're thinking about um, timber production, for example, and we need some advice on um, accessing and maintaining chainsaws, is there already a, a company in our country that sells and maintains chainsaws who we could get to kind of bring in advice that, that, that would help our business? Um, and, uh, and finally, you do an analysis of what's, what's the support that we as a farmer organization can already provide and where do we need to bring in expertise from outside? And that's the sort of creating the, the network of, of contacts that I talked about in, in the diagram. So what we're try really trying to do is to get a list of the people we want to support, our clients, which areas we're going to help them. And then we try and do some sort of uh, interview or survey of our groups uh, and talk them through each stage of their business, each stage of the value chain and where they might be struggling. And then we map, well, can we provide this advice already? Maybe this is something we already know how to do and all we need to do is to teach the, the group how to do it. Or do we need to make a link to find somebody from outside who will uh, help our businesses progress? So that's the, the, the first step in, in the business incubation process is deciding who you'll help and understanding their needs. And you might, if you were, if you're a very big organization, you might think, well, we can't provide support to everyone all at once. So we're going to start with a particular area where we'll support groups in this area to start with. And we need to to understand how many groups there are, how many potential enterprises there are in that area, and how many other sort of institutions are already providing support and who they are. Um, so you're probably talking about an initial kind of field visit when you're setting up an incubator, you need to do some background research and think these issues through so that you know who you're going to try and help where they are, what sort of businesses they're trying to start, and who else might be able to help you um, 
uh, in your network of, of business incubation. And this is very much what um, happened in, um, in Cambodia uh, when um, there's a, a program called the Non-Timber Forest Product Exchange Program. And that program is trying to incubate um, businesses of many different sorts in different countries. And in Cambodia, when they thought, well, we want to help community forest groups, um, and some of those community forest groups scattered all over the country were producing honey. And so they decided that the best way of helping them would be to help those honey producers form a single association, a single federation for honey production within Cambodia to increase the volume of honey that the, they could sell in the marketplace. The problem was that different honey producers were producing very different qualities of honey. <laughs> Often they were using very traditional methods of cutting down the tree in order to, 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 to extract the honey. They weren't using um, filtration to get very pure quality honey. And so as an incubator, NTFPEP, said, okay, we've, we've talked to these honey producers, we can see what the problems and challenges are, and we need to do several things. On the right-hand side, you'll see a book, and that book was produced in a local language, and it, and it explains the processes of producing quality honey. So they learned what the best way of producing quality honey was, and they developed a guidebook for the for the members of this federation to make sure that the quality was always meeting the standards. Then they needed to help the um, producer groups to get the right equipment in place, to know where to source the right equipment for storing and filtering honey. Uh, they needed help with um, how do we package and label our honey? Where can we get jars? Where can we buy these jars? Where can we get a label set up. And so they helped them to, to understand these different bits of the value chain uh, so that the Federation as a whole began to produce these very beautifully packaged um, products which could be sold to tourists and to supermarkets um, from all over the country, from different uh, areas. So that might be an example for you of you, you, you might have several groups who want to produce the same thing and they would benefit from working together and having common quality standards, common labeling and packaging, uh, the right equipment and so on. So that's an example from Cambodia. Um, uh, so if you, if you want to do this, I guess the best way is to uh, prepare a questionnaire to assess what the needs of the groups who want to run businesses, what their needs are. And you might want to think, make sure that you ask enough questions in that questionnaire. So, so try and stimulate um, them to think through. It's not just issues of what we grow on the farm. We also have to think of, well, how can we get do we, do we know everything we need to know about finance uh, and markets? Do we need to know everything? Do we need to think about legal documents and permits? Do we need to uh, work on our natural resources, the way in which we're planting and processing um, our products? Do we have any problems with our organizational cultural issues? Um, and this is very important to think particularly about challenges that women might face in, in running businesses if they have not got the same access to uh, natural resources as men. Um, and, and then do we have anything we want to do differently, but we don't know how to do it yet, <laughs> sort of in the research and technology. If any of you are familiar with the market analysis and development toolkit for business startups, you'll know that asking questions in the, each of these five areas 
is is the the way in which that toolkit helps people set up a business. Um, so you can use those areas of MA and D, the market analysis and development, to to create a questionnaire and ask your your the people you want to help. Do you struggle with any of these areas? How could we support you in any of these areas? And like I said, you, you need to get those, your, um, your clients to talk through the business with you. So, you know, here is a business in Brazil that's trying to sell timber. Um, they're a cooperative. They run a community forest area in the middle of Brazil. And they, they have to have some quite heavy machinery to get those uh, very large timber trees out of the forest onto the trucks and then into a stockyard. They need to have, uh, they've got a local buyer who's a sawmill and they need to be able to deliver their products to the local sawmill and get a fair price. And then there are various markets for their products. So one way of uh, finding out about the needs of, of, of your business groups is to get them to talk through the value chain, how the product gets from the, the farm or the forest to the place where it's um, marketed. And, and that's one way of finding out what their needs are. So um, here is another example. Um, and this example is from Guatemala. And uh, the, the Guatemalan, it, it, this is north of Guatemala, there's a big area of forest, and there's an association of uh, many different community uh, producer groups. And they were producing primarily uh, timber, trying to produce timber sustainably, but they wanted to know, well, what other businesses can we, can we run? And one of the, the ways that ACAFOP, the association, which is a producer organization, helped to incubate new businesses was to link, to, to do some market research. And they found that um, there were various people who were buying um, palm leaves. And, and they thought, well, what, well we, we could make this into a business if there are people trying to buy palm leaves we could make this into a business. The reason the buyers were buying palm leaves was for Easter celebrations in America. So they were, they were wanting to have Easter Sunday services where they waved palm leaves in the same way that um, when Jesus uh, entered Jerusalem on a donkey, all of the people waved palm leaves. And, and it, it turns out that there were a lot of churches in America trying to buy these palm leaves, um, but they wanted a particular type of palm leaf. They didn't want a brown dead palm leaves. They wanted nice green palm leaves. And so ACAFOP tried to help the producers, particularly women's groups in, in the communities to produce the sort of palm leaves that would be sold. Um, and they, they taught them how to grow the palm tree. They set up a nursery for growing the palm tree. And then they taught them how to harvest the leaves into nice uh, bundles. And they, they, the best way of storing and transferring these palm leaves was to keep them cold so that the color of the palm leaves was, was green until the buyers uh, it reached the buyers. And so they, they set up a, a refrigerating unit so that you could collect the palm leaves over several months and store them in those brown packages um, in a refrigerated, in a cold room, so that um, when they arrived in America um, uh, on Easter Sunday or Palm Sunday, um, they were still fresh. And that business now is, is worth several hundred thousand dollars per year. And the incubator, ACAFOP, who'd learned about business from timber, helped the women's groups to make a business out of palm leaves, selling palm leaves into the market. 
And so that's an example of, of how an incubator can, can work with the uh, local groups to say, what, what is it that you need help with? And they needed help with how to grow the palm, how to process it and store it, how to pack it up and send it to the market in a way that made a lot of money for them. So you, you will find out when you ask your members what businesses they want to run, the areas of help that they need. So maybe they need help with um, farm advice on growing and, and, and harvesting. Maybe they need help on processing. Maybe they need help with business management. How do we, how do we run a business organization? How do we set up a the terms of reference, uh, uh, um, what do you call them? Um, <laughs> it's escaped me. How do you set up a constitution for an organization? How do you develop rules for, for um, managing the group? You know, replacing the manager every three years. So they may need help with various different bits of running a business. And once you, you have a list, of what, your, of what help your groups need, you can then think, well, is there somebody external who is already helping them? Is there a project <clears throat> in my country, in Tanzania or in L Liberia, which can already help them? In which case you, you, can, you can note the external skills available. You can also think, well, we have some experience of running businesses in our pharma group. Could we offer, um, do we have available skills that will help them? And um, so you, you note down, you know, who in your organization could help them to, to overcome this particular difficulty that they're facing. And then you have to have a list of things that are missing where they have, they're struggling with a particular problem and there's nobody external that you know of who's helping them. You don't know the answer inside your organization. <laughs> um, and so you've got a missing uh, skill set. And, and then the job of the incubator is to make inquiries, um, at, usually in, a, in, in the local city or in the local town, who can help us with this sort of advice? Um, and that's the way you build a network of useful contacts. Um, is there a, um, a local, a, you know, a government research and training center? Is there a local chamber of commerce who might be able to help you? And, and you try and fill the missing skills that you need in that way. So, we're setting up this incubator and we have to think, okay, we now know what sort of, um, what's, what our clients, what help our clients need. And we know what sort of thing we could offer in, in our own organization. Can we set up a structure within our forest and farm producer organization that actually helps these people on a regular basis? So, in any forest and farm organization, you will have some sort of structure of your organization. Usually you will have an advisory board of some sort, and then maybe you will have a management team for your farm organization, usually a, a manager, a treasurer, a secretary. Um, and you will probably also have uh, a different department in your organization, somebody who's working on timber, somebody who's working on, um, uh, you know, agricultural production, or maybe you've organized your organization differently. So what you have to think is, should we establish a new business incubation unit? Who, who will we make responsible for developing businesses within our forest and farm producer organization. And that's the first step. Think about what you've already got as a structure. 
and then try to think, well, where would this best fit? Do we already have a, a business support unit um, that we could uh, uh, build on? So when, when you're thinking about setting up a business incubator unit, usually the best thing to do is to select the people within your organization who are best at business. <laughs> Somebody who already really knows a thing or two about business. So they might become the manager of your business incubator unit. And you might need to identify other staff within your, within your uh, organization who could provide services to the people you want to help. But usually you won't be able to have all of the knowledge in your organization already. So you'll need to think about having external experts who you can draw on to help you. They may belong to a non-government organization or a government research department or a small business support unit or the local church. Who could be your expert uh, support group? Um, and sometimes if you have um, in your farmer organization a, a board of advisors, you can choose people for those advisory roles who can help you with your business incubation. And so um, I guess the, the trick of this stage is to try and put somebody in charge, make somebody responsible for a business incubation unit, have other staff who will be willing to help and have particular skills, and then think, well, okay, we've got our core unit, but we also need to make links to um, particular types of um, experts who are outside our organization and can help us. Um, and that's the, <clears throat> the process we, we almost always go through. So if we come back to this diagram, you'll see that the business incubator group is really trying to form a network that can give advice in many different areas. You can link people to government authorities, you can link to research and development people, you can link to business experts, you can link to technical um, experts, you can link to people who know about how to set up social organization. Usually in countries, there's some sort of cooperative, um, farmers cooperative organization who can help with setting up good social organizations. And then you need to make links to the banking sector, you know, people who offer you credit like Zanaco in Zambia or um, the other, other development banks. And so you're not trying to do everything yourself. You're just trying to establish a network of advisors who can help you and help your businesses to become better than they would otherwise be. Um, <clears throat> let me give you another example of um, this is uh, a, an incubator called Farm Africa. It's a non-government organization and they were working in southern Ethiopia trying to help um, <clears throat> coffee farmers. Now in Ethiopia coffee um, is, occurs naturally in the understory of the rainforest. And there's a particular um, market for speciality coffees. Um, and Ethiopia is the origin, it's the home of coffee. And so Farm Africa wanted to help the groups get a better price for their coffee. Um, but the problem was that the farmers had very variable um, coffee picking uh, standard. So they didn't understand how to pick the highest quality coffee beans, and they didn't understand how to uh, dry and store and process the coffee to meet the, the highest standards. And so Farm Africa, um, they didn't have all of that expertise in their house. So they asked 
they tried to find a coffee expert who could help them give some guidance to the farmers on how do you um, collect and, and process, dry and store your coffee? How do you test it to show that it's good quality? How do you package it um, in a way that um, meets needs? And, and by the time they'd finished their business incubation, the farmers groups were selling their coffee to an Italian a coffee, coffee company called Le Piantagione. <laughs> and that company was paying the farmers 10 times the price they had been receiving at the beginning of the incubation process, because the, the company knew they were getting high quality coffee, which was all produced and stored and processed uh, according to the best standards. So Farm Africa are then in a very good position to help other businesses do that and uh, develop their own coffee businesses. <clears throat> also in this section, um, we need to think about, well, how would we pay for the, the businesses where the business incubation process? And when we looked at business incubators around the world who are helping forest and farm producers, they were getting their money from, from many different ways. So Plan Junto in Ecuador, almost all of their money for the incubation services was paid for by the farmer groups themselves. So Plan Junto said, we can, we can give you training in this, we can give you training in that, but you need to pay us for it. And that's one way of of, of trying to provide business incubation services. The other way is sometimes governments will give grants to, uh, to help uh, you um, provide business incubation services. Um, maybe there are projects that can, can pay for your, your business incubation services. So you, you might be able to develop a project with an NGO to support businesses. But by far the easiest way of, um, of providing, paying for business incubation services is if your farmer organization is making money from the businesses of the farmers. So if your organization is selling product into the market and making a profit, and then out of those profits, you assign somebody to help other businesses in your farmer groups develop their own business ideas. And you can say, well, we'll help to sell your products as well. And because the more products that you're selling, the more profits you're making, that can then mean that you are able to provide, you can pay for staff within your organization to help other businesses establish. And I think within the forest and farm facility, we're really trying to move towards a model that's like the right hand circle, Feda Covera in Guatemala, where the business incubation unit is actually paid for by the profits of selling um, products into the market. Um, I hope that's all clear. Let me, let me give you an, another example. I'll, I'll move more to African examples as we go through this training, but I just want to give you a vision for what is possible. So, so this is a, an example of a farmer cooperative. It's a farm forest cooperative in Sweden called Sodra. It's about 100 years old. So this is not something you will achieve overnight. Um, but they, they were at the beginning, 100 years ago, they were getting very, the farmers were getting very poor prices for their timber. And that was because the traders were coming in and saying, well, we'll pay you this amount for your timber. And if you don't sell to us, we'll go and buy from your next, next door neighbor. <laughs> and, and so the price was very low. <clears throat> so the first thing that Sodra did was they said, well, we, we are going to agree that all the farmers in our region will only sell their product, their timber 
through this association, through this cooperative. And that way the traders can't negotiate individually with farmers, they have to negotiate with the farmer organization and we will set the price. <laughs> because they got a much better price for their timber, the cooperative started to make much more profits. So it would deduct a small amount of the sales price to run the cooperative. So the farmers know they're getting a better price for their timber, so they're happy to deduct a certain amount and, and, and allow that money to be used to staff the cooperative. And once the cooperative had, had a knowledge of how to run business, it thought, well, maybe we could <clears throat> also start to diversify our businesses and we could maybe, because we've got a lot of profits from our timber sales, we could invest that money in things like a, a, a new nursery to, 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 to produce high quality timber seedlings that will grow faster so that we will make even more money. So they set up a nursery business, they set up a sawmilling business so that instead of just selling the trees to the buyers, they're now selling sawn timber, which is much more profitable. And at the bottom, you can see this is the newest thing that they're doing, which is they've set up electricity factories using wood chips, um, which are burnt to produce electricity. And all of this has come because the farmers decided to work together as a group and they decided to give business support to different businesses based on their experience that they already had of how do you run a good business. Um, and a hundred years later, this community forest cooperative in Sweden is one of the world's largest timber companies. Um, so it's, if, you, if you make business incubation knowledge about how to run business central to your farmer organization, then ultimately you will learn how to do good business and you can develop into a very successful and profitable organization. That's been a lot of talking. <laughs> and I'm now going to pause um, at this point and invite any questions on anything I've said so far. Is there anything that you're unclear about? Um, is there anything you'd like more information about? Duncan, there's been a couple of questions and comments posted in the chat. Would you like me to go through yes, those? Could, could yeah. you read those to start? Well, yes. any, anything you're unclear about, please, please do ask a question because um, we, can, we can give you more information it, we're trying to compress a, a two day training into a two and a half hour training here. <laughs> so there will be things that we're not giving enough information on. Yes, Kata. So Taki Kwame Paul is asking, is it possible to start selling locally before um, the business is formally registered? And what happens if the producer organization is registered as a nonprofit? Hmm. Uh, two very good questions. Um, for the first question, I would say that um, it's very important that you do start locally. Um, so the best way of starting a business is to know that you have some buyers for your products. What, what, what are people asking to buy? Um, if you don't have a local market, that will buy your product, then it's very difficult to start a business. And also you need to gain experience in how to meet the needs of that market. What sort of uh, quality do they, do they need? You know, have, have you asked the people who are buying your product <clears throat> what sort of quality, what sort of packaging, what sort of volumes, what containers they, they would like to buy. So starting local and building a business to meet the local market is almost always the best way to start. And that's because if you want to sell a product nationally or even internationally, 
you have to meet very strict quality standards. You're competing with other businesses who've had a lot of experience. <clears throat> so I would say, yes, please do think of incubating businesses to meet the local markets. I think that's critical. What was the second bit of that question? Oh, Katia, you're muted. Sorry, what happens if the, um, the essentially it, business incubating unit is set up as a nonprofit? Yes, um, that's, that's a real challenge. And I think um, this is often the case where registering an organization, you can register an organization as different in as different things so you can have it have it set up as a non-profit association or you can set it up as a cooperative which some in some countries have a really bad reputation or you can set it up as a business and there are different um costs associated and different complexities i think farmer organizations um as business incubators ideally would want to be set up as for profit um, businesses you want to be able to take the product from your farmer groups and sell it to the market and provide business advice to the groups who are providing that that product to you um, in a commercial way but that might not be possible at the start so you you can get started any which way you can, um, but just bear in mind that how you choose to register your organization will affect whether you can uh, make a profit from the, the sale of products and therefore how many staff you can employ, uh, uh, how many paid positions within that organization you can have and so on. So it's a very good question and it does de depend I can see Vincent has um, uh, raised your hand. Vincent, have you got a question you want to ask verbally? Yeah, no, I wanted just to say a bit more on, on your response for a, a, a registration. Mm. Like if an Apex organization is registered as not-for-profit, but it can be an incubator for a member organization which is registered for profit. Yes. But itself is not a profit-making organization. It's uh, like um, created uh, for other non-profit needs, like uh, market linkages for its members who are into profit, uh, linking to finances, policy engagement, they could be registered like that, but they provide business incubation to the members who themselves yes. are into business. That's what I, what I thought I could just add. I think that's really helpful, mm -hmm. um, Vincent. So, mm -hmm. so in that model, the umbrella organization, the apex organization is funded presumably out of membership fees of the groups it helps. And it's non-profit, but it can still provide staff because the, it has members and paying membership fees, but it, it itself does not act like a business. Instead, it helps its members to act like businesses. Um, and that's a very good model as well. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Duncan. Hi. Yeah, I guess uh, something similar to uh, Vincent's point. Um, we also have to be, um, cautious and sensitive to the um, local situations. Mm -hmm. There are specific national laws uh, that has to be complied with, depending on um, the activities that some of these smallholder organizations have to uh, want to uh, you know, engage in. And it is one critical area. If we don't do it quite well, and they begin to make good profits mm -hmm. and become competitive, the big businesses that knows that they are this uh, legal uh, mm -hmm. potholes, mm -hmm. Yes. We use that opportunity to bring them down. So in Ghana, for instance, we, we did an analysis of the, uh, uh, the FFPOs, and you see that they can be registered under different categories, social welfare, cooperative department, the registrar general, and all that. So you have GAFA, which is established as a, a, a national federation, 
and its main operations is consolidating the advocacy efforts of um, member FFPOs and trying to assess uh, available opportunities for members. So its registration is more under the not-for-profit. But under GAFA is the business incubation wing, which is the, uh, uh, the GAFA green market, which is supposed to support members to consolidate their business efforts, aggregate and add value in order to make um, profit. So if we don't register that subsidiary as uh, for profit making, uh, 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 subsidiary of GAFA, and then you go operate only with GAFA and you begin to make money, then somebody takes you on that you are not registered to make profits and you are making profit. So the law will get on with you. So I think uh, the local laws in the various uh, countries also need to be uh, taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Elvis. That's very helpful. Um, good. And we've had a number of, of, of uh, comments and questions. So we have a comment about in Tanzania, selling through cooperatives has been very successful for some crops, but the idea of cooperatives offering incubation services, not so common. So, so we need to think this session is the financing business incubation is a very useful um, idea. And somebody asked whether we will be distributing the slides at the end of the session, which we will be. So every day when we give out the homework, my hope is that Ali will be able to um, e email you um, the slides that we've used so that you can use them when you're doing any, any, any afternoon um, thinking about the homework. Um, uh, and we had... Um... There was an interesting question from Sophie um, okay. regarding selection criteria. Um, yeah. Given that an, uh, a business incubating effort might not be able to support all of the potential business ideas of its members, what would be useful selection criteria um, for selecting the best or the most promising business or the most? Yes, um, and uh, um, I guess uh, you, you need to have some, if you're choosing who do you support and you've got limited resources, I guess you want to start by picking groups who are producing something that you think there's a really good market for, that if you supported that group um, to build a, a business, it would be something that could expand because there's good, strong market demand. Um, there are many people who could potentially produce the product um, that you can see in your own mind that you could diversify from a simple product like selling raw coffee beans to selling more advanced products in the future um, so that you can invest. If you support that business, you think, well, we'll start with selling something simple, but over time we can help you to sell different types of product um, and make more money that way. So it is useful to think through what are the criteria who, which we would need to, 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 to use to select between many people who might be wanting support and pick in that selection, try and pick ones early on that would really benefit a lot of people where there's a good strong market and where there's plenty of opportunity for um, processing that product in different ways to make more money in the future. Um, I've, I've got a chance just to take a couple more because we're running a little bit behind time. Um, there's a very, the, uh, Hamisi said, this is a very good presentation. Can you share experience on how you can start to organize individual farmers who are doing business individually in order to be a group for doing bulk marketing? And that, that's a very important question. And um, usually to make that possible, the group has to be able to buy the product in advance from the farmers and then sell it on bulk to the buyers. So the group needs to have enough cash um, in order to be able to pay farmers for their product, aggregate it, and then sell together to the market. 
how do you do that if the group doesn't have very much cash? And maybe the, the best way of doing that that we're exploring in different countries is for groups to think of building up a savings and loans fund over time that has enough uh, cash in it that eventually you can buy your product from many different farmers uh, using that fund. And then when you sell the product to the market, you replenish the fund so that it acts as a sort of um, cash flow fund for you. Um, that's probably the, the simplest way of doing that. But it takes a lot of will, a lot of um, trust that you need to build in the organization and its leadership so that you can set up a, a, a group um, a group account, financial account, so maybe a savings and loans fund, and then eventually get to the position where you can um, agree that you'll sell as a group you can buy the product directly from the farmers, first of all, and then sell to the market afterwards. Um, Kenny Mang, you had your hand up. Um, I'll just take your, your question and then I might have to come back and answer some of the other things. Yes. Um, and it's not a uh, actually an uh, uh, addition to your presentation. Uh, uh, in case uh, the support and service institution wants to prepare the detailed clear needs assessment correction here, yeah. yeah. I think one of the key reference points would be the developed business plan by the groups. Yes. Because if those uh, business plans are adequately developed, of course, uh, they should folk, they should feature the training needs they would need. They would need, of course, it would be clear on the business. Then from there, the, the, the support of the business plans. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny Mang. That's very helpful. Right. Um, I'm afraid because of time, I'm going to have to, to, to press on with the last module that we'll cover today. And, and this will, we, so we've thought about what business incubation is and why it's needed in the first module. We've looked at how do you choose who to help and, and what sort of needs they might have and whether you can provide those needs from your own experience or whether you need to get a network of advisors who help you. In this uh, final module, we're just going to race through what services you might think about offering, how to deliver them and follow up, okay? So I'm going to talk mainly about these next two sessions. I don't really have time to talk about how to measure impact today. Um, but the, the, if you've decided we're going to try and provide incubation services in our cooperative or our farmer organization, um, what sort of services should we try and focus on and how do we manage um, that whole support process? When we looked worldwide at what services incubators were providing in rural areas, um, this was the list. So we, had, we, we did research on 10 incubators almost all of them were providing business planning support. How do you plan a business? How do you manage your finances? And how do you do market research? So almost all the business incubators were doing that. They were also, a lot of them were doing um, advice on farm management or on growing the crops or on harvesting the timber. Almost all of them were trying to advise on product developing. How do you develop a product for sale? And almost all of them were trying to give some advice on technology upgrading. And you'll see there's a long list of other things that they were providing advice on. How to develop a brand, how to manage a group, um, how to do quality assurance. So make sure that all the farmers are producing the same sort of quality. And you can quickly set up quality standards 
you, you identify what best practice is and then you provide advice on quality assurance and then a range of other things um, that you'll see. So when you're thinking about what services should we as an incubator be providing to our um, groups, there's probably some core services that you need to, to think about providing. And that's in the area of um, market research. You need to help groups to uh, actually ask the buyers, the people who are buying their products, how you could improve your product so that they're more likely to buy it and they're more likely to pay a higher price for it. Um, that area is very important in terms of um, incubating a business. Secondly, financial management. Um, really, the core of any business is understanding um, its finances, knowing when it's making a profit and when it's not making a profit. I'll talk a little bit about this on the very last day, about building access to finance. And finally, you need to be thinking about some sort of business planning process. So developing the idea of your business, what it is you're really trying to do through your business and having a plan that covers, you know, how your production process is gonna be managed, uh, who you're going to sell it to, uh, how you're going to overcome the challenges and risks it faces and so on. There are other areas that will be more specific depending on what sort of groups you try and support. So it might be advisory to work in a particular type of um, product to start with, uh, you know, and help them to understand how they could uh, improve the quality for that particular product, produce guidelines to support them, help them to understand what technology is being used so the incubator might travel around and visit different um, pepper producers and find out what, what, what's the technology they're using for grinding the, pe the pepper. What, what are other people using to pack their products up for market? You know, you can vacuum pack things, you can put them in jars or bottles, or they can be plastic or glass. So, so you might want to start with um, particular value chains but over time, um, our, our intention in this forest farm facility is to help people to diversify and have many things, a basket of products that they're trying to sell. And I think Mark, you commented on that in the, in the chat, that the more things that people can sell, the less risk they have, both economically and from things like climate change. And so, um, so you, you, you might then move to develop, help them with product development. How do you develop new products and, and so on? So I think it, when you're planning what services your incubator will supply, you need somebody in your incubator who knows about business planning, managing finance and market research. And then the other areas you can develop over time and maybe bring in external experts at the start. So here's an example from um, the Indonesia. This is a community forest farm group, and they were trying to, um, uh, the, the, the local NGO uh, was trying to support the group to develop businesses based on their products. And one of the things they wanted to do was to try and diversify what they sold. So they were selling agricultural staple crops mainly. Um, very competitive markets, quite low, low profits. And instead, they also had in their farms these trees, which were called candle nut trees. You can see the fruit. And if you crush the, the nuts, um, you can either eat the nuts, I think, or, or you can crush them and you can make an oil, um, which is, is used in cosmetics as a sort of beauty product. And so the, the incubator began to research what sort of um, uh, cosmetic products people were using 
in the market, what sort of labels they had, what bottles they were put in, and so on. And so they helped this group to develop from being just a farmer group selling um, farm products to a group that was also producing hair care oil, minyak kemiri from the candle nuts um, that was being sold in the local supermarkets. So it was, they were helping them develop a business that would add to the farmer production and diversify the, the, the products and provide income uh, for, for people, which would encourage them to grow trees on farm, which also helps the, the environment and climate change and so on. Um, so a, bi a business incubator uh, like for the candle nuts would be offering advice on the core business bits. This is, we have a product we want to sell. We need to develop a business plan for it. Uh, we need to have set up an account and have an investment account so that we, we can uh, actually buy the equipment we need to put it in those bottles and to crush the nuts to make the, the oil. And we need to do some market research um, uh, to find out what people are buying in the local supermarkets and so what they might buy if we produced that product. And so those were the core services that they offered. Um, and, and you can see that outside of the core things, you often don't know everything about that, that you need to know to help a business grow. And so if you, when we looked at the 10 incubators, quite often they were having to go and bring in external experts to support particular new technologies. That's not something you're going to have expertise on in-house probably. So you need to find somebody who makes and sells those machines and come and do a demonstration and, and, and show how it works and see whether the farmer groups are interested in, in that particular technology. They also um, often looked outside to get help with market and trade fairs. So they tried to form links so that their farmer groups could go and to a market fair and showcase their products. And they didn't do that internally. They made links to existing trade fairs and, and, and business meetings and so on. Quite often they, they asked for external support um, to, to get legal help uh, with register, how do you register this business? Uh, what, what are the advantages and disadvantages and so on. So always when you're setting up a business incubator, think, well, there are some things we should, we should learn about and have expertise on in-house. And then there are some areas where we will need to find external experts and gradually make up a uh, uh, you know, an address book full of useful contacts who we can call on. And, um, you know, this is uh, an example in Nepal where the local uh, farmers groups were growing um, a poplar tree on their farms and the poplar tree was used for making uh, paper. So the fiber from the poplar tree was very long and very useful for making paper. And, and ANSAB um, had very good core business expertise in the areas of um, business planning and uh, accounting and uh, uh, market research, but they uh, needed uh, to, to, to draw on others um, for particular um, business linking um, services. So they, they linked into a trade fair on, on products that put them in touch with a cosmetics company who wanted to use handmade paper, beautiful handmade paper in packaging their cosmetics. You can see in the bottom left, the sort of products that that company, that cosmetics company wanted. They wanted these beautiful boxes made of handmade paper. And ANSAB uh, you know, went outside to get external help to provide them with um, those sorts of um, expertise. So when you're, you're 
thinking about services to offer, often one of the services that comes up is where can we get access to money <laughs> to, to buy our new equipment? Um, and people often think that the first point of call is to go to a bank, but banks are very skeptical of loaning money to uh, farmer groups in remote areas for strange things like forestry. So often they will be quite resistant to giving money, especially if the groups you're supporting are very new and haven't got a long track record and haven't got a bank account that's got very a long, a long history. And so if you can't get money externally, the only place you can really start is to sell your products and to use some of the sales money, the profits from sales, to develop a group savings and loans fund. And that you can then use that savings and loans fund to loan monies to farmers, say for processing equipment that they need to meet the quality standards for a product that you want to sell. And um, so think about mobilizing internal finance. In the forest and farm facility, it's been the case on several occasions now that buyers who want to buy a particular product will invest some money in the farmer organization to establish a more professional processing technology. So in Vietnam, um, a buyer of cinnamon uh, products put up 20% of the investment costs for a, for a cinnamon processing plant. Um, and, and once you have a, a, a bank account, a savings and loan fund, maybe you've got some finance from a buyer, then it's much easier to negotiate with a local bank if you need a slightly bigger amount of money for, for a particular piece of equipment or for cash flow or something. Um, sometimes in some countries where the incubators are within a for-profit farmer organization, um, the, the incubator itself becomes a credit provider. Um, so that's, that's one model that we've seen in a, in a couple of Latin American countries particularly. So if you, if you are a large farmer organization or a large cooperative and you're generating substantial funds, you can often set up a credit a loans facility for your farmer members to invest in useful equipment and that increases the quality of the product and so the farmer cooperative ultimately makes more money itself. Um, projects are a good thing if you want free money but they're hard to come by. Um, so when an incubator is trying to help um, uh, local groups to get access to finance uh, it's the most common way they do that is by brokering a discussion or a link with a bank in some way or a project in some way. And like I've said, some, some incubators develop, they become so good at business incubation that they get projects and that can offer grants to their member groups. And in some cases, incubators make money themselves and can loan money to farmer groups. It's not an easy uh, road finance. So you, you will have to develop, you will have to decide how and where to provide your services. Um, are you going to do your trainings in a, in a central area of your farmer organization or your NGO or your program? Or are you going to go out into the field and deliver client uh, businesses where the, 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 the producer group is based. So most incubators try and go out into the field and deliver trainings um, with the groups themselves. Some do it online um, if farmer groups have access to mobile phones or other ways, and some bring the farmers groups to them to, to a single training school or a training point. Um, Quite a, quite a few times we've seen um, incubation happen very effectively just by taking one set of farmers to see a business that is already working, run by another group of farmers. And you almost don't need to do any training. 
you just take the group and show them and they can ask questions. Well, how did you make this work? What equipment do you need? So that can be a very effective way of providing incubation services, just arranging a peer-to-peer -peer visit or exchange. So uh, Sophie asked the question, well, who do you select which groups to help? Um, it, when you're managing an incubator, you need to decide who it is you're going to help. So you need some criteria for that in the management um, team. Uh, that might be that you're only going to help democratically owned forest and farm producer groups. You, you don't want to help individual private entrepreneurs, but you might do the reverse. Or you might have a criteria, we're going to focus our incubation where we see really, you know, lots of market demand, lots of buyers for our product. Um, or you might focus on things that, that you can really supply in volume, uh, that you're familiar with supplying in volume. So think about that in your management of the incubator. And you might want to develop a formal process where groups have to apply to the incubator, you review and score their application, you choose which ones you want to help, you have an interview, and then you select them. So if you've got many groups who you're trying to help, you might have to have a formal process. And then once you've selected your incubator, this is just thinking about the management of the incubator itself. You might then want to do a more detailed um, field visit and talk through different areas of the business. So you might talk with them about how, how their their rev you know have they got enough cash finance to do their business do they have enough natural resources to meet the demand from buyers have they got enough buyers so that they're not at risk of one particular buyer pulling out um, do the staff within that group do they need a bit of training or, or capacity building uh, how are they doing with government um, uh, formal registration how are they doing with brand? So think of um, interviewing your clients about different areas of their business so that you build up a picture as an incubator of how you can help them in the management section. Um, this is an example of, um, of a business in uh, Sulawesi in Indonesia. And the farmer group were pulling rattan which is a long cane uh, spiky cane out of the forest um, and they were selling it to traders um, and it's a lot of work it's very painful work because it's very spiky and uh, they were getting very poor price so the incubator went and and did a um, it, it had a process of of uh, going out and interviewing the producers and saying well what are they what are the uh, challenges you're facing in terms of financing and so on, in terms of producing this material? One of the things they found when they did those interviews was that the buyers really wanted to buy um, pre-processed rattan. They didn't want to buy raw rattan. And the way of processing rattan is to put it in a a boiling oil bath that kills the potential um, bugs that can, um, borers that can, can be inside the rattan and which, which decrease the quality of the rattan. So the buyers wanted to buy um, processed rattan, but the, the producers didn't know how to do that. And so the buyer, the incubator then went to a rattan expert and said, how do you set up an oil bath? And they found somebody who knew how to, to build an oil bath for the local uh, community and the community paid for it. And the, the process of um, processing that rattan meant that they could double the price they got from the traders. So everyone benefited um, through the incubator's action. And the, and the way it happened was simply that the incubator went and talked with the um, producers and they talked with the buyers 
and they decided what is the block um, that's that's holding this business back. Um, so once you've asked them what they need, you then might have a, an incubator kind of contract. You have an action plan. We are going to help you in this way. We're going to provide this training on this date and, and we're going to check what you've learned and so on on this day. And so for whatever area of, of, of support you've agreed with your client group, you then have a plan that you, you, you formally develop with them and say, well, we promise we will provide you this sort of support and advice and bring in this expert. And then it's your job to make sure that you honor your side of the, the uh, agreement with the producer group uh, so that they trust the incubator and the incubator team. You can, you can measure uh, your progress. So you could, um, you might want to take stock when you do that initial interview, you might want to collect information about um, how much profit a business is making now, how many hectares of, of this particular crop they're producing, how many buyers they have, how many staff have been trained, um, how, you know, uh, things like electricity supply and so on. And then once they have been supported by you, you can go back to that group and say, well, now tell us how much profit you're making, how many hectares of this crop you're growing, how many buyers you have. And so you can measure the success of the incubator by the change in the um, groups that you're supporting. And if you want to, to have a project to try and win project funding for your, for your business incubating work, you can show to the project, um, the, the, the development agency, we can prove that we're successful because we keep a record of those people we help and we know what their situation was at the beginning and we know how, how much they've advanced with our incubator support. And so you can trust us to do a project on business incubation for you. Um, and that's one way an incubator can get project funding if you measure and monitor your progress. Um, so, for example, in, in, um, in Indonesia, um, the, the, uh, one of the uh, businesses that a community were running was they had a small sawmill. And that sawmill produced a lot of um, sawdust waste. Um, but actually, you could use that sawdust waste uh, to make um, the uh, substrate for growing mushrooms. So you can see they bagged up the sawdust and, and put in the uh, seeds of the spores of the mushroom, and they, they put some water in to make it moist. And then they stacked those bags in a dry place, in a, sorry, in a, in a cold, in a cool place in the dark. And, and the picture in the center at the bottom and the left shows the mushrooms blossoming out of the sawdust. And so the incubator had said, we will help you to develop this business and we're going to measure your profit on timber production at the start. And then at the end, when you have this new business, will measure your profits and that will prove that Javlek, the incubator, is a good business incubator and so it can win more project funding. So this, this is what I've already told you. You can measure your, your impact of your support work to attract further support from NGOs and government and so on. So these are some of the things you might want to measure. Um, you know, how much money they turn over, how many jobs they create, uh, how much finance they've attracted, um, any certification they've achieved. So you can measure impact and that, and that can help you as an incubator attract funding. Um, 
just as an example, in Zambia, many of you Zambians will know Agbit, um, which is an incubator, and they have uh, 25 uh, questions they ask a, a business they're, they're helping. Um, and, and then at the end of the business, they have targets each year, and then they show what they achieved through their incubator support. And that proves that they're doing a good job. Um, so here's the, here's the example of um, uh, in Vietnam, the Vietnam Farmers Union um, were acting as an incubator. And what they did was to work with cinnamon tree growers. On the left, you can see the cinnamon trees growing. And they worked to attract a, an investor to, to help the cooperative build quite a large factory uh, with money from the bank, money from the, the buyer, and money from the cooperative. So the cooperative put in 20%, the buyer put in 20%, and then the banks put in 60% to build uh, a thing. And the incubator, Vietnam Farmers Union, now use this example to show how effective they have been at business incubation. And that allows them to attract project funding. So I'm a little bit over time, I'm afraid. And, and many of you have stayed bravely until the very end. Um, so I'm going to just give you a little piece of homework now. Um, uh, but before we have the homework, I, is everyone happy to stay on just for another five or 10 minutes? I'm sorry I've run over. I knew there was lots to get through today. Yes. Thank you, Saluma. Yes. <laughs> OK. Well, let me. Great, thank you. Um, well, let me just then um, quickly explain the homework that I want you to do. So sometime this afternoon, I would like you to think about a particular business, a farmer group that you know, and think what are the challenges that they're facing? And then I want you to think, if I was a business incubator, which of those challenges could I help them with? What services could I provide to help that farmer group do its business better? And then I want you also to think, what of the challenges they face do I really not know how to help them with? And is there a particular person I could ask to give me the help I need to provide, to help them with that challenge. So is that clear? So I want you to, to list a few of the challenges that are being faced by a farmer organization you know. Think through what services they would need to help them with that uh, business. Which of them could you provide individually or people within your organization? And where would you need to try and create uh, a link with an expert to help them move forward one more step? Is that clear to everyone? So what we will do is I, I maybe write on a piece of paper um, a, a few challenges faced by the group and then what you think would be useful services, trainings or um, you know, uh, uh, exchange visits or something that you could do to help them. And then some things that you think I would need to have an expert, I would need to find an expert to help me help them with their business. Um, and, and tomorrow morning, what we'll do when we arrive is we will break into three groups and we will nominate one person from each group just to feed back their their homework. So you could say, well, I, I'm working with this farmer group and they're trying to sell uh, cassava chips and they're really struggling because they need a processing machine and they're also struggling because they haven't got enough uh, transport and they're also struggling because they haven't got enough buyers. And I could help them with the training on cassava processing, but I need help with transport 
and doing some market research. So you'll present back your homework to the group and you can discuss it in those groups. And then we'll, we'll start tomorrow to have a discussion on, okay, is there a way in which a business incubator can work regularly with its business to help them look at their challenges and risks and identify what they're trying to fix in the year ahead. So we move from the idea of an incubator to how do we do a regular process of risk assessment and risk management with businesses tomorrow. I'm, I'm absolutely willing now to stop and um, uh, take questions. Final questions, maybe for 10 minutes. Were there any questions, Kata, that came up in the meantime? No, not that I can see. And Sophie put an, uh, she wanted to mention that an important difference with any business service provider and a business incubator is that it will not be a one-off support, but a longer term support for that business. So that's very important. So a business service provider comes in and they do one thing with that group, they provide a training and then they're off. But a business incubator is, is a team that stick around for several years with each of their businesses and really try to help them in a longer term way. That's very useful, Sophie, thank you. Sophie made another very important point um, uh, a bit early on saying that not every forest farm producer organization can indeed be a business incubator. And she um, put in the link again to the toolkit um, where there is some information provided on kind of internal capacities would be necessary yes. to provide such services. Yes, I think that's right. I mean, I think if you're a very small um, producer organization, then you might not have enough staff or time to offer business support to other groups. So what we're really trying to focus on here is on producer organizations that are more like apex level, um, larger organizations thinking through how could we spread uh, good successful businesses um, within our area. Yeah, so thank you for that clarification. And Donald, you've asked, thank you for the presentation. Can we get the slides for our review? Yes, please. Um, Ali, I think I, I sent you as a PDF day one presentation. Would you now be able to send by email that to all the participants so they can get that when they're doing their homework? I hope you'll just spend a few minutes on your homework. Um, you know, try and think through for, for your particular context what we've been saying, um, and that'll help us tomorrow. Ali, were you going to chip in? Only to say I've set up a share folder. With which I will share the link to. So I will email the, the slides, but also set up that folder and, and we can put other useful documents in there. Okay, thanks very much, Ali. So you'll receive an email from Ali and you will also receive a link where you can find the toolkits and other documents that we're trying to share with you. Great. Well, in that case, I'll stop sharing and um, and I'll just thank you for your participation today. I hope we'll keep it interesting and engaged um, going forward and look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Um, and uh, yeah, bye-bye for, for now.